Libby, welcome back. It was a great uh, interview that we did last week, and I'm looking forward to the things that you have to say today. So let's start with um, your background as, a, as an MP. You were elected in 1997. How different were things then in the community compared to the 70s and the 80s? Also, who was Bud Osborne? And what role did he play? Thanks, Jace. It's great to be back again, um, helping with some of the history and the background about the downtown east side leading to issues that are still very much present today. Um, I did get elected in 1997 and my most vivid um, experience about those early days now more than 20 years ago is that the community was in crisis. It was in crisis from drug overdoses. Um, people who used drugs were very much criminalized. They were subject to the um, criminal justice system. I mean, now today we sort of think of it as a health issue, right? Addiction and people who use drugs. Um, we think of it as a health and, and, and issue of, of helping people. But back then law enforcement was the primary tool for dealing with illicit drug use. Um, and so when I first became elected, in fact, one of the first events I went to um, in the summer of 1997 was a, a huge event in Oppenheimer Park called the Killing Fields. And local activists, um, including Mark Townsend and Liz Evans from the Portland Hotel Society, and with a organization called the Political Response Group, that Bud Osborne was involved with and was the forerunner to Vandu, the Vancouver area network of drug users. They organized this huge event and erected 1,000 wooden crosses in Oppenheimer Park to signify the number of people who had died of overdoses over um, a number of years. Um, it was very visual, it was very powerful. And I remember marching from Maine and Hastings. We stopped the traffic at Maine and Hastings and it felt like the city just went silent even for a minute, you know, in, in observance of the memory of all of these people whose lives had been needlessly taken because of the illegal drug market and because of criminalization. And we marched to Oppenheimer Park and I remember Bud read some of his poetry and there were other speeches. And I, I went to Ottawa with that. I went to Ottawa with that. And that was very different than my experience from the 70s and 80s as a young organizer. I mean, still many of the same issues, housing. But, but in those early days when I was a young organizer, homelessness was not an issue. Homelessness began to emerge um, under um, the austerity program of Paul Martin, who was the finance minister for the Jean Chrétien liberal government in the late 1990s, 1995 and on, we experienced severe austerity. So all of the federal housing programs that as a city councillor, I had um, you know, voted for, for various projects, social housing in the downtown, he said, all gone, all dried up. Um, massive cutbacks in Ottawa. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt that we are still living the impact of those um, needless cuts from 1995, 1996 and on when we had no national housing program because of austerity programs. And it was literally balancing uh, the budget on the backs of poor people. I mean, that's how I and many others characterized it. Um, so, you know, compared to the early 70s and 80s, housing was always an issue, getting decent housing, but there wasn't visible destitution and homelessness on the streets that we saw then going into the late 1990s and then into the 2000s and even going into the Olympics in 2010. And of course, even now today, um, so that was very different, but also the drug overdose crisis. I don't ever remember there being a drug overdose crisis prior to the mid late 1990s. So that was the first critical issue. It was really those two issues that I faced as a newly elected MP for Vancouver East, which was, you know, the east side of Vancouver included the downtown east side, Strathcona, uh, the Gastown area, the, the core of the city. Um, and so I went to Ottawa with a, 
a great sense of um, determination that what I had witnessed in the neighborhood from these overdoses and, and the destitution on the streets from homelessness was something that I had to find a way to fight, to raise, to get it visible in Ottawa. It was not on the national agenda at all. Um, I, and you, you mentioned Bud Osborne. I met up with Bud, I'd known Bud Osborne for a couple of years before, prior to being elected. Uh, but when I became elected, I began to work very closely with Bud Osborne. He was a legendary poet um, and activist in the downtown east side and his, his poetry books, um, 100 Block Rock, Lonesome Monsters, Down Here. I mean, some of his poetry is, is just absolutely incredible. And Bud was very much um, the uh, instigator of the community resistance and transformation around the drug issue. Um, he, along with Anne Livingston, formed the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. Now this was a new entity, unheard of. It was literally people who use drugs coming together to talk about their own experience and to, and to take on politically the massive agenda of prohibition and the criminalization of people who use drugs. That doesn't seem like such a big deal today, but back then in 1997, 1998, this is prior to Insight, the first safe injection site that didn't open until 2003. These were huge battles and it very much reminded me of the early days at DIRA where it felt like the second wave of resistance. DIRA was the first wave. The issues were a little bit different. Some of them were similar, as I said, but Van Du, the emergence of Van Du as a grassroots organizing initiative, um, to me felt very familiar to what DIRA had all been about. And so I worked very closely with Bud, with Anne, with others. In fact, Van Du made me an honorary member of the organization, which I felt very proud to be. I would go to their meetings. And the toughest thing for me, though, was to figure out how to raise the issue in Ottawa, how to get attention for people who were dying. And because of criminalization, because of enforcement, because of a lack of accessible treatment, because of the poisonous drug market. And at that time, the big battle cry or the big cause was to open a safe injection site, which of course later became known as, as Van Du. Um, and, and so that was a huge battle. It took many years to actually get insight open with uh, you know there was opposition in the neighborhood from the some of the merchants particularly the chinatown merchants there was opposition politically at all levels even the provincial government it was an ndp government at the time they were not in favor of such measures um, so the whole notion of extending what we call harm reduction um, and, and and enacting low barrier uh, low threshold services such as safe injection sites um, was again considered to be very radical and I mean my email box was full every day of constituents who were like are you crazy you know you're just enabling these drug users get them away get rid of them you know lock them up um, you know you're you know I'm never going to vote for you again and on and on and on and on it went but it was it was that mobilization in the local neighborhood with Van Du and groups like the Portland Hotel Society uh, that eventually ran Insight that, that helped me keep going, but with, became a very powerful movement. So Libby, when you got these emails from your constituents, people who had voted you in, how did you respond to those people? Well, I had a choice to make. Um, even, even my former campaign manager said to me, Libby, you know, be careful. You're, you know, you're sinking so much into this. And people would say to me, you'll never be reelected. You'll never get elected by speaking out on this issue because the, the general mantra of the day, particularly from politicians was, you know, more law enforcement, tougher laws, you know, um, put people away. Um, and many of those emails I got were centered around that. People wanted greater police presence. They wanted tougher laws. Um, and of course we did later go through the Harper years where that all began to happen. But I, I felt like I had a huge choice. It almost felt like an ethical choice to me that either I was gonna speak out and defend 
the rights and the dignity of my constituents, some of whom were people who used drugs and some of whom were victims of the criminal justice system, um, or I was gonna play along with this, you know, easy line of, yeah, 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 let's get some more cops, let's get increased police presence, let's get tougher laws. And I felt I couldn't do that. I got to know many of the people who used drugs. I used to go to the Van Du meetings. I used to hang out at Maine and Hastings, just talking to people on the street. And I couldn't in good conscience do anything but call for, in effect, the end of prohibition and, you know, and for safe injection sites and for a different, a health-based approach. Um, and, and I thought to myself, you know what, if I don't get elected, so be it, you know, but we have to speak out. And I did that with the community. I mean, I had allies and they kept, you know, I, I, but in Ottawa, it was a different scene. Nobody wanted to talk about this issue, not even my own caucus in the NDP. Uh, it was like, okay, this is, not, this is not a vote getting issue. This is not on the political agenda. This is about, you know, a bunch of no goods in one neighborhood or maybe elsewhere across the country. And, you know, we're not gonna talk about safe injection sites. We're not gonna talk about ending the criminalization of these people. This is, you know, so even internally it was a big battle. And so I learned a lot by working on the issue and learning how to work with people and learning how to navigate the political system to help bring about changes that were desperately needed. So it sounds like uh, amongst the powers that be, you were very much alone. And how did you deal with that? Where did you continue? How did you continue to draw your strength to carry on? I did feel very much alone in Ottawa um, at the beginning. It began to change later on, but I would move motions. I would make statements in the house. I would make speeches. I would organize events. I would hold press conferences. Um, but it was working with people like Bud and working with Van Du. I mean, every, every week I would come back to Vancouver on that plane from Ottawa and I'd be dead tired. And, but as soon as I got back into the community, it would reinvigorate me. And I, I just felt this enormous sense of drive and motivation that I had to do more. I had to do more. People were literally dying. Well, they still are. They're dying on the street uh, because, because of these um, policies under uh, that viewed the issue as a criminal justice issue. And I felt it was my mission, literally, to change that attitude and to change those laws and to help get insight up and running, which it eventually did in 2003, three after many battles. Can you tell me, uh, go into more detail about the, the battle for insight? Well, I remember being at meetings I organized in a community um, where there'd be like, you know, 100, 200 people and people would literally be screaming at each other people who wanted insight and people who didn't want insight, who thought it was, you know, the worst response ever and wanted tougher law enforcement. And I remember literally standing in the middle of the room with my arms out going like this, you know, like, stop, um, let's talk about this. And so uh, what I learned is that, you know, first of all, not playing into the drama, like trying to bring forward reason and evidence. And there was evidence from Europe that um, safe injection sites were very much part of the solution. They weren't the problem. Um, so we relied a lot on bringing forward real evidence, working with um, some researchers and people like Dr. Martin Schechter at UBC, who was uh, wanting to conduct um, uh, heroin maintenance trials for people. Um, so I had, I had people that I could go to and learn from and get expert information, but the most important information absolutely came from the people on the street who you were using drugs themselves. They knew what needed to happen, but those folks felt very cynical about what, what would change, right? They had no faith in the political process. They were right. They were very outside of the political process. So it was, it was kind of a, a beautiful thing in that on the one hand, I was, I was, the motivation for me was working with the people who were affected by the issue, but they, what they were getting from me was encouragement and possibility that we could change it, that I could help figure out, help them figure out how to change it, that we could change the law, we could set up insight, 
We could even deal with a conservative government. You know, we could even go to the Supreme Court of Canada and get a ruling that said that Insight was um, a, a health uh, measure that was needed in people's lives. Um, and so it, it's, you know, it's that kind of dynamic of working with people very closely and having faith in each other, supporting each other, relying on evidence that I think really um, carried us. But it was also the mobilization. Van Du was a very active organization. I went to Victoria with them where they held demonstrations outside the legislature. I brought Bud Osborne to Ottawa um, at least twice to meet with the Minister of Health. I set up a meeting with Alan Rock because I, I figured we had to convince the Federal Minister of Health because it required a change in federal um, drug policy laws to allow Insight to operate legally, right? And so, you know, all of these little things, um, you know, they take time, but but there was that. But there was definitely a goal of what we were trying to accomplish, um, and it was it was you know it was a very invigorating, exciting time, um, and 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 I think Vancouver, Vancouver led the way in North America. Absolutely, Vancouver, the downtown east side, led the way in changing um, the public perception, the political perception, and the legal um, framework. Of, of responding to, um, to uh, drug use. Is it possible to identify a particular thing or perhaps a couple of things that really turned the tide and made insight possible? Well, <clears throat> Bud managed to get an, a, an emergency resolution passed at what was then called the Vancouver Richmond um, Health Board, now the Vancouver Coastal Health, which is the regional health authority that governs all healthcare in, in Metro Vancouver and beyond. And Bud got appointed to the Vancouver Richmond Health Board. And I helped him write an emergency and a resolution to declare an emergency in the downtown east side, a public health emergency. Um, and I think that helped change, um, that, that, that was a pivotal thing. Um, certainly the opening of Insight in 2003 was, was, was pivotal. And I should say the city of Vancouver, uh, Mayor Philip Owen, for example, was very supportive. He was one of the strong advocates. Um, so there was support locally. It was more that Ottawa and the province were a problem. Um, so definitely the, you know, the physical opening of Insight where people could actually go and inject drugs safely and, and prevent overdoses from, uh, from, in, from uh, injecting drugs was, was you know, uh, a tipping point. Uh, and Insight has been studied so much, right? It's like, you know, more than 20 plus studies looking at the evidence of, of how Insight operates and what it, what it does. And it literally has saved hundreds, if not thousands of lives. Um, but of course, now we're far beyond that. And I know we'll get into that. So, but Insight, uh, a safe consumption site, the first of its kind in North America, it really set the way for the changes that were to come later. Can you just tell me what other similar types of, uh, of facilities have been modeled after Insight? Well, now <clears throat> in BC, there's um, many um, what's called overdose prevention sites. Uh, there's, um, in fact, even under the a, a subsequent provincial liberal government, they declared a provincial emergency and set up um, the public health officer, public, um, Dr. Perry Kendall in about, um, I don't know, 2006 or maybe later, um, declared a provincial um, sort of state of emergency in terms of overdoses and allowed these overdose prevention sites. So they do operate now in, in many different places around BC, particularly in urban centers and now across the country. Um, Montreal has some sites, I believe Toronto. It's been a battle in other provinces. Um, in Ontario, it's been a battle because the Ford government has opposed these kinds of measures. Um, Montreal was a little bit easier, but it was very difficult. Um, so I, you know, I basically ended up working on this issue on a national level with advocates across the country um, because it was a national issue, this overdose crisis, and it still is today, as we know. Um, yeah. And what about internationally? 
North America was far behind. It, I mean, the whole impetus for harm reduction and safe injection sites came from the European model. Um, I actually visited um, Switzerland, uh, the Netherlands, um, uh, Germany, um, to look at um, safe consumption sites with a parliamentary committee and we issued a report calling for such uh, services in, in Vancouver. Um, and so, you know, the model of harm reduction and this idea that there's a spectrum of services from very low threshold, you know, for safe consumption to long-term treatment, to better housing, to social support was something that was very well documented and very well used in Europe. Uh, and then later, you know, we saw countries like Portugal begin to um, take much bolder decriminalization measures on drugs overall. So, so it wasn't like from that point of view, Vancouver led the way, but in Canada, certainly that was the case. I mean, Vancouver and this one neighborhood, the downtown east side has always led that campaign and advocacy for um, you know, very significant changes in drug policy um, and, and, and changing it from a criminal justice issue to a health issue. What other issues were there from that point in time? Well, it it's, was a busy place. Um, certainly housing was still a major issue. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the federal government had basically canned all of the national housing programs. So no new social housing was being built, no co-op housing, no housing for special needs. Um, and so homelessness was rising. So that was a major issue that I took on in Ottawa, demanding uh, liberal and then conservative governments to um, bring back national housing programs. And we're only just now getting back to that point. Um, the Liberals eventually um, set up a homelessness program, uh, but it was a far cry from what was needed as a, a national housing program to actually provide housing. So that was a huge issue. Um, ongoing issues of poverty. I mean, basically people living far below the poverty line um, was an ongoing issue in the neighborhood. Um, you know, provincial welfare rates, provincial disability rates were far below the poverty line, almost, you know, impossible. I defy anybody to live on the amount of money that one received each month after you paid your rent. And so, you know, the sandwich lineups, the food lineups got bigger and bigger um, as people struggled to make it through the month. Um, uh, you know, other issues, I mean, I. Um, lack of community space, you know, uh, there's very little green or open park space in the downtown east side. Um, so economic development, uh, then lack of economic development in the neighborhood. And then as we, as we started coming towards 2010 and the Winter Olympics, there was enormous fear that um, people who are on the street would be pushed out either evicted because there was a great rush to use all available housing for you know, the millions of visitors who are gonna come. Um, there, so there was a great fear around people's civil liberties. And uh, I remember Amjo Hal, who was a local activist organized uh, uh, the homelessness hunger relay straight strike for about a year. And for uh, he invited different people for a week at a time to basically go on a hunger strike I did that for a week outside the Carnegie Center at Maine and Hastings and I had this great flip chart with me and I would ask people to write down what they were experiencing or what they wanted to say about housing issues, homelessness issues. And uh, I took pages and pages and pages back to Ottawa and read it out in the house. Uh, and then later Am organized what was called the Onto Ottawa Homelessness trek, which was in memory of the famous Onto Ottawa trek of unemployed men and from the depression, the great depression in the 1930s. And so Am organized a whole bunch of people on the train right across Canada and they arrived in Ottawa. And I remember meeting them and taking everybody out for pizza in the Bytown market in Ottawa. And, uh, and again, you know, pushing in Ottawa, calling again for um, a national housing program. I had a, a bill in Ottawa, a private member's bill to, um, to develop a national housing program. It got tremendous support across the country. Um, so yeah, there were, you know, there was lots of issues. Um, 
you know, at the same time we were dealing with, um, you know, the impacts of neoliberalism and the trade agreements and austerity programs, public cutbacks. I mean, all, you know, it was pretty difficult times for people to go through. And of course, the lower income you were, the harder it was to survive these times and to, and to you know, find a, a quality of life that could get you through. So all of these different issues, where do they stand today? We've made progress. There is definitely progress, um, but there's still big battles ahead. And I would say um, the, the biggest advance is on the, um, uh, on the drug policy issue. Um, we've talked about how in the early 2000s, getting safe consumption sites or safe injection sites was the big demand. We're far beyond that now. It, I mean, basically, people working on this issue came to the realization that it's one thing to provide a safe medically supervised site for people to inject so they don't die of an overdose, but it doesn't deal with the underlying issue, which is a poisonous drug market, that people are buying drugs on the street. Uh, you have no idea where they come from, uh, what, what the cocktail mix is. And, and as we got into um, you know, a few years ago, we, we saw increases in um, drug overdoses from fentanyl, um, you know, people just like dropping, you know, of these terrible overdoses. And so the, the <coughs> excuse me, the debate began to shift to calling for a safe supply of drugs, actually creating legal supply that people could use people who are chronic users who needed that kind of support, who could be medically supervised. And so that became a big call in Vancouver and has now been moving across the country. We're making progress on that. Finally, the federal government just actually very recently announced uh, what's called a SAFER program that will allow um, doctors to prescribe um, drugs that normally would be illegal to use and that people would be getting on the poisonous drug market. Um, and then beyond that, beyond that, there's also a call for a decriminalization of all drugs. And Vancouver is again leading the way on that. Uh, mayor Kennedy Stewart, the mayor of Vancouver, uh, was able to get a unanimous resolution from Vancouver City Council calling on the federal government uh, not only for a safe supply, but also to decriminalize police enforcement um, of people who use any kind of drugs. Um, I mean, we've obviously seen the legalization of marijuana. Now we're talking about decriminalization of all drugs and shifting from law enforcement to a much more um, um, health-based approach. So those are very significant changes that Vancouver is advocating and leading the way on. We're not there yet. There are still uh, many overdose deaths. It, it is a complicated issue, but tackling um, the poisonous drug market and creating a safer supply um, and decriminalization are two, uh, I think, major responses that will help mitigate the, the, the terrible overdose disaster that we've seen. Tell me uh, more about what housing issues um, and homelessness issues, how has that changed? The federal government supposedly has now committed billions of dollars to housing programs, but actually to get the housing built and get people in the housing, you know, is can't do it overnight. Um, we still have serious homelessness issues in Vancouver. Um, I know that you've, um, you've given quite a few of the views of, of the, the, uh, tent cities in Strathcona Park, uh, which is part of the downtown east side or immediately adjacent to the downtown east side. It's, it, it's an issue that causes a lot of friction in a neighborhood. Um, it's an issue where people's safety is very much at risk, particularly in cold weather where there can be violence, um, unsafe conditions. So, um, so tackling homelessness from a from a point of view of both an interim immediate response as well as a long-term response is still very critical. And I don't think we're there yet. I mean, it's still very visible on Vancouver streets. I think people are very distressed about it overall. Certainly the people who experience homelessness are 
living in very dire circumstances. Um, the city council, I think, has been doing as much as it can to respond to the issue, but it does also require the provincial and federal government. Recent announcements by um, provincial minister, David Eby, who's the new minister of housing, have been very encouraging um, in that he's committing to having, I think it's about close to 400 units built by the end of April. So it's very ambitious, um, but this is, you know, I, this has been a crisis in the making for, for more than 25 years. It's really, you know, to me, it's a failure of public policy that we've witnessed, deliberate public policy that came from austerity programs that were an abject failure, just like the so-called war on drugs was an abject failure, both politically, economically, and, um, and, and you know, any way you'd care to look at it. Um, so that's still a very big challenge, both for the city and for the community. Um, and I, I, yeah, I would say the homelessness issue, housing and the drug issue are still the two big things that need to be tackled that we don't have an adequate response. But what underlies it is also poverty. You know, uh, uh, it, it, to, for people to live so far below the poverty line and not have an adequate monthly income to bear to buy the bare necessities of life you know food shelter transportation clothing um you know I, like we're not going to get further ahead until we until that is dealt with politically and responded to um and so that's a big issue too how has COVID 19 made all of this intensified all of these issues a year ago as covid was just beginning to emerge and we were all beginning to understand the ramifications of the pandemic there was terrible fear about what would happen in the downtown east side um, because people do live in such close quarters in the old uh, hotels and rooming houses that we talked about in the first program the sros the single room occupancies um, very deteriorating conditions people crowded on the street. But what was what has been amazing over the last year is that there's actually been very, very few cases of COVID in the downtown east side. And I credit that to the work of the city, the health work authority and the frontline workers. Um, there's a number of organizations, uh, the Portland Hotel, Rain City, Atira, there's you know a number of them, Lookout, the overdose prevention site that we talked about, they have literally had people on the street every day, monitoring people, taking people's temperatures, like talking to people and where necessary, putting people in isolation um, and, and getting treatment. And so the fear that we had that COVID would be rampant in the downtown east side actually has not happened. Uh, I mean, touch wood, fingers crossed that it, nothing happens more. Um, <clears throat> And it's, it's really been more contained. So that's been good. But it has made the provision of regular services much more difficult for some of the um, frontline organizations. And it certainly made people's lives more difficult. Like I think people who live in Vancouver, if they have driven down East Hastings Street or Cordova, they'll notice that there's many more people literally camping out on the street and, and that's because people were afraid to be inside because they were so closely quartered. Um, some, you know, places closed down where they would normally get services. Um, so, so the visibility on the street became much more, uh, much higher. Um, and I think that has concerned a lot of people. Um, but I, I, I do have to say, I think um, that the, service, the local services, the health authorities, the city, um, you know, meals were delivered to people, for example, making sure that people could eat properly. It's really been quite remarkable. So it sounds like when government and organizations do what's needed, the result is a positive one. When, when a government, when governments want to act, when they can declare an emergency and respond as an emergency, things happen. You know, you can prevent a, a disaster, you can mitigate a disaster. And that's, I think, partly what we've seen with COVID in the downtown east side. And so now we've got to build on that and sustain the support 
in the neighborhood um, to keep people going, right? And um, and it's got to get a lot deeper than that. I, I, I think one of the sort of burning underlying issues is the lack of um, sustainable economic development in the neighborhood, right? And and somehow that has to be tackled so that this neighborhood can, can prosper and thrive, uh, but always with the caveat that the priority is the people who live there, right? The priority is the low income residents who lead very precarious lives and, and to provide supports and economic activity and, and employment and uh, support services, um, you know, it will be transformational. It can be transformational. That's what we need to do. I think it was about a year ago that the Army and Navy store shut down a store that offered relatively low priced goods of just about every nature, as I recall. What's been the impact of that closure on the community? Well, people from all over the city shopped at Aren't the Army and Navy. It was sort of an old institution in the city. Um, and it, you know, the impact is both physical and economic. It's physical because when you walk by, you know, half a block of a boarded up structure, um, you know, it makes you think differently, like what's going on here? And of course, the Army and Navy is not alone. There are many businesses that are now boarded up that used to be, you know, operating and surviving and doing okay. So it does have an impact both physically in terms of how, how you feel about what's going on in the neighborhood, but also economically. Um, and I, I feel like we're only at the beginning of a sort of a discussion or a debate about what we need to do economically in this neighborhood, uh, because it's literally been one crisis after another. So responding to the crisis often prevents you from getting to other issues, right? Um, but, but those other issues are still there. And I think economic viability um, uh, is, is a very important one, but, but keeping in mind that it, it's not an economic viability that sees the wholesale eviction of people. This, ha this is a, a low income community that can survive. This is a low income community that can show that things can be done differently um, and that, that you can create a healthy, strong, safe neighborhood um, right on the edge of the glittering glass towers of the downtown area. Um, and it can be a home for people. It can be a, you know, a good place to be. That's what the goal has always been. And I believe passionately that it is entirely achievable. In the beginning of the pandemic, BC provincial government raised the uh, social assistant assistance rates by $300 a month. And in January, cut that down to half and likely, as we understand it, ending completely at the end of March. Could you comment on that? Oh, terrible, terrible decision. I, you know, there's now a big backlash against it, of course, you know, to, to provide people with a temporary measure to help them survive and then to take it away. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just horrible. Um, so uh, I, I hope very much that, that that decision is being rethought and there's a recognition that we, you know, you cannot expect people to live on a pittance. You, you know, it, it's like a, it, it's, I find it so ironic, right? That people who are poor are often blamed for their condition their situation. Um, and yet, if you if you have no resources, if you have no income, like life is pretty well hell, right? And so providing, you know, livable incomes is a prerequisite to creating stability and, and creating a healthy neighborhood, right? So, it, and, and the payoff for that, if we want to just look at it in crass, cold, calculating, economic terms, the payoff for, for creating that stability is much better than keeping people homeless and, you know, having people sent by ambulance every few minutes to the local emergency rooms or having overdoses. There's millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent um, in 
in basically emergency responses that are that are falling far short of what needs to be done. Um, I mean, this point has been made so many times, you know, if you provide people with safe, secure, affordable housing, you save money in the long run and you create good jobs. You know, you can create good jobs. You can build housing that's based on on um, on sustainability and green technology. You know, there's like it's a it's a wonderful social and economic investment that pays for itself many times over. But, you know, we still have to get there. What would you have to say about the temporary modular housing program that the city has uh, has put in place? I don't know why we didn't find and figure out and do the temporary modular housing like 30 years ago. It is brilliant. Well, first of all, the name is a bit of a misnomer. The, the modular housing itself is not temporary. It's extremely well built. It's all prefabricated and it's brought in on, you know, uh, mobile truck things and assembled. It's, um, it's a small number of units. Most of the temporary modular housing is about mm, 30 or 40 units per building. So it, it kind of can move into an, a, a community and neighborhood in a very unobstructive way. Um, so what's, what is it that's temporary? The part, the, part, the part that's temporary is the land that it's on. So they, basically the temporary modular housing is on land that's leased from the city. I think it's basically the city. Um, so it's, it's not like they own the actual land, right? So that's the temporary part of it. The actual housing is not, is, it could last for you know, many, many years. Um, most of the temporary modular housing has support programs built in. So there's like 24 hour staff, there are people, they have their, people have their own unit, they have their own cooking, their own washroom, they have community space, they often have a community garden outside, little, you know, open space. So I'm a huge fan of the temporary modular housing as, a, as an efficient, economic, affordable and sustainable measure to actually provide housing in a way that is respectful and, um, and adequate, more than adequate. Um, so we need to do a lot more of it. Libby, I'm going to ask you the big question. Do things ever change? Um, and if not, why not? Why are so many things today that were an issue 40 plus years ago have we not made progress? Good question. It is the big question that many people think about, talk about. And the fact, well, first of all, there has been progress made. I mean, many of the issues um, that we've talked about, there has been progress made. There are people living in really good housing that you know didn't exist um, three years ago, five years ago, uh, and beyond that. Um, so from that point of view, there are people whose lives have improved. Um, things like insight, uh, now the drive for a safe supply are things that are fundamentally changing um, what's going on and are, I think, um, positive things. But I think we also have to face the reality that many governments have failed over the years in a systemic way to respond to the issues in the downtown east side. And it's, it's very easy to blame the victim. It's, and we talked a little bit about this in the, our earlier program, you know, the idea that you blame people themselves because they're poor, right? And that you say, well, a ghetto is bad and all of the stigma that goes with that. And that's been an enduring argument in the downtown east side. And I think in some ways it's prevented the kind of response that's required, um, an economic response, a holistic response, a community-based response. And so we have all these sort of bits and pieces, but the biggest impediment and the reason why we still are requiring major changes is because over those 40 years, we have also experienced, because of neoliberalism, because of austerity, because of privatization, a massive, massive devaluing of people's lives, a devaluing and, and undermining of people's rights, whether they're labor rights, human rights, housing rights, health rights, 
you know, erosion of the public health care system, abandonment of federal housing programs, uh, uh, record poverty levels because the welfare or pensions never kept pace. These are all public policy failures. And so I, I just get really furious when I hear people blaming the neighborhood or blame or saying, you know, we're pouring millions and millions of dollars down this neighborhood and nothing ever changes. Well, then let's ask the question why. Let's ask what hasn't been done and what went wrong. And, and for me, it is that systemic failure of our economic and social system that has allowed the downtown east side to just, you know, slide and deteriorate, you know, and then every now and again, there's sort of a push and something gets better, but the, but the underlying issues of, of um, social and economic conditions in the neighborhood have not been addressed by, in fact, that not, not only have they not been addressed, they've actually been made worse by neoliberal policies. And I've lived through that. I know this. This is, you know, this is not a debatable point. This is reality of what's happened in this neighborhood over 40 years. When I was 19 years old and started working and living in this neighborhood, people were not destitute. They were poor, but they could go for a cup of coffee at the Ovaltine Cafe. They could, you know, basically get through the end of the month. That all changed, right? There was no homelessness back then. There was no drug crisis back then. You know, people weren't thrown out on the street. The neighborhood wasn't gentrified. People weren't evicted wholesale. Um, so, you know, that's why things have been difficult to change because those issues have not been addressed. We can address them. They are entirely politically possible and feasible if there's a political will to carry it out. Where does that political will come from? What do we need to do to make that political will a reality? Well, I believe the political will comes from us. You know, um, governments can be blamed, but at the end of the day, we as a community, whether geographic or whether by population or a movement or a campaign, we have to bring forward the political clout um, to force these changes, right? To change these public policies that have been such a failure. Um, and of course, governments have to respond. And so it becomes very much part of a democratic um, debate and exercise about our political voice. And so that's where the, the political part of me comes in and says, you know, this is about a political movement Right, and it's not dissimilar in what we're seeing in many other movements, whether it's Black Lives Matter or whether it's indigenous rights and reconciliation. Um, it is about, um, you know, a, a grassroots political movements, but also knowing how to interact with the political world, right? You can't just ignore the political world and say, well, we feel cynical about it. They're all rotten, they're all bad. So let's just write it off. We, we have to engage. We have to bring about change both internally and externally, right? So some of that comes from the pressure from these social movements, but we also need to have allies. We need to have um, people who champion what we're doing on the inside. I mean, this is what I feel like I've spent most of my life doing. And what I wrote my book about is the idea that it's a it's sort of the outside in, right? We can't we can't ignore the political system and the world of politics. If we do, then we leave it to those who already have power to continue doing what they're doing and dispossessing everybody else. So we we have to take charge of our community, of our desires and needs, our rights. Um, and so when we do that, and when we organize, we can have political clout, as, as we've seen in the downtown east side. Many people would not have believed that the things that have happened there could have changed in a low income community. And it did because people got organized, they found their voice, then they gained political clout, they learned how to work on the inside and the outside, and they made it happen. So that's, that's what we have to continue to do. Well, I think you've already kind of at least partially uh, answered the next question is, how do you think the community sees itself today? And, and who is the community? 
Well, I think you'd probably get varying opinions on that. You know, people see the community in different ways. Um, there, it's a diverse community. You know, I mean, there are stereotypes about the downtown east side, but it's actually quite a diverse community. Um, there's a strong indigenous presence in the downtown east side. There are families, there are lots of seniors uh, with the retired resource workers that we talked about at the very beginning. Uh, from the early days, some of them are still kicking around. Um, and there's also younger people who have moved in, right? There's artists, there's, because gentrification has taken place and some of those battles go on. So the community is diverse, but I think it's really important that whoever is there, that we protect the rights of low-income people to remain in their neighborhood. Uh, to me, that's a basic principle uh, that we have, to, um, we have to bring to realization. Um, I think it's a strong community. I think the community sees it that itself that way. I, I think things are very tough. It's, it's, you know, that this is a neighborhood that has endured unspeakable grief over many decades. Like that takes a toll on people, it really does. When you see your friends die of the overdoses, of homelessness, um, you know, of, of, of mental illness, um, it, it's very debilitating. So it's, it's also a community of grief, but through that, I see that there is a very, there's a resilience, there's an enormous strength in this neighborhood. If it weren't there, the neighborhood would have gone a long time ago, would have been obliterated like all other North American skid roads, you know? Um, and so the fact that people are still here, you know, I think about the poetry of Bud Osborne, um, you know, his poetry was so powerful in speaking to people about what was possible and what they could do. Um, so I, I think that, that, that kind of thing keeps us going. Mm -hmm.